So my name's Dido Milne. I'm a director of CSK Architects. And um, Matthew and I built our first house just over 20 years ago now on a tiny site in Brick Lane that we bought at auction. Um, it was supposed to be finished in time for our first child, as you can see from my very advanced condition on the left. Um, and that's when we learnt the first rule of the self-builder. It will definitely take much longer than you thought, whereas your pregnancy definitely won't. Um, anyway, it was a very useful early experience in terms of being a developer architect occupier and finding a site, financing the project, etc. However, um, although there are aspects of this building that we still really like today, um, we probably weren't confident enough at this point to pursue a really strong architectural agenda which if the budget allows, it's probably the most important part of building your own house as an architect. Anyway, it's something we learned from um, when it came to our next significant um, self-build opportunity, um, which was Cork House. Um, the story behind the site for Cork House is wrapped up in buying a larger house in 2010 for our family and Matthew's mother, um, who lives with us. Um, the site is part of Tanger Island in the Thames, on the edge of Eton, very close to where we both work. Um, and it's shared with Thames Water um, Extraction Site and an Eton College Garden. Um, an existing Georgian mill house sits roughly in the middle of a sort of odd-shaped site, which is also fairly complicated in legal terms with lots of leases and covenants and so on. But most importantly, it has a slightly disconnected parcel of land um, at the rear, which we knew we'd want to build an annex on for our extended family, and this turned out to be the site for Cork House. So with this in the background, we developed a clear architectural agenda which was three inter intertwined ideas, um, all involved with the notions of simplicity in one way or the other. The core drive of the project is a questioning of the layered building envelope that has gradually developed to meet um, contemporary building performance standards. So typically you start with structure, which is insulated. Usually you have vapor control and breather membranes are introduced before adding external framing and cladding and internal linings and finishes. To create a layered building envelope, an inherently sort of complex assembly of different materials, products and systems. So, for example, when we talk about brick house, the structure is usually actually concrete block or timber frame with, say, a brick outer skin combined with huge range of different materials and products, which can introduce complexity at every stage of the building life cycle, especially at the end of the building's life with destructive demolition where everything's been glued and stuck together with the downgrading of resources. So the aim here was to replace all of these separate layers and products with a single material, and in this instance, cork, from internal finish to external finish, thermal insulation, low bearing structure, and finally, the control of moisture transfer. So the basic hypothesis was, could we replace this complex layered model with a solid cork building envelope to meet current performance standards? And we wanted to do this with expanded cork a pure plant-based material from a biodiverse landscape that has the potential to create a simple relationship between human inhabitation and natural resource systems. And perhaps most importantly, in relation to this talk, um, we want to develop a self-built construction system with a very, a very direct tectonic, based on the very simple forms of load-bearing masonry construction found in many ancient precedents from our own Neolithic culture at Maze Howe in the Orkneys, to Mayan culture on the other side of the world, where the entire structural form is a result of a very simple act of placing one piece of stone on top of another. The structural sim similarity between stone and expanded cork is important here, in that both materials really only work in compression, but of course cork has a much lower thermal conductivity, so it's a f in, in a way it's a form of insulative stone, which can be used to create a thermal envelope. The self-build brief was also generated by the idea of delivering this simple structural form as a prefabricated kit of relatively lightweight parts that could be assembled without mortar or glue by hand, um, sort of like a giant plant-based Lego, if you like. So in 2013, we had the site, we had a clear architectural agenda, and with a healthy dose of blind optimism that is necessary for most self-builds, um, we embarked on a six-year research project comprising three self-builds of increasing scale and complexity. This iterative process of research, design, build, research, design, build, um, allowed for a very single-minded approach to the project as a whole. So starting with the tiniest building, the casket, I'm now going to hand you over to Matthew. Hi, I'm Matthew Barnett Howland. I'm Director of Research and Development at CSK Architects, where I work with Dido. 
So I've always been interested in making and materials as the starting point for design. So I began with hands-on research in the Bartlett workshop using basic woodworking machinery, making test assemblies, looking at basic principles of how to make the wall, whether we could make the roof using the same method, and starting to think about rainwater ingress at the joints and so on. On the basis of this initial work, I made a fairly simple prefabricated building kit that could be easily transported to Eton. And at this point, the prototypical system included timber dowels and lime mortar, which introduced complexity during construction and in performance terms as well. Although flawed technically, this seed structure showed enough promise in terms of tectonic form and spatial character to undertake more extensive research. The second prototype, the cork cabin, was the main output for the funded research stage between 2015 and 2018, which was undertaken with several industry and academic partners and part funded by Innovate UK and EPSRC. With this funding in place, we returned to the purity of monolithic cork with no other elements within the building envelope at all. In the form of a simple tongue groove joint with an interference fit, we discovered that although there is a simplicity in asking one material to perform all the functions of a building envelope, the shape of the blocks themselves becomes rather complicated, especially in the corbelled roof. So in order to achieve the levels of precision required for a friction fit system, we started working with the Bartlett's robotic facilities, developing digital tool paths for the various block types in the cabin design. This was really interesting in terms of the expanded role of the architect, where we're designing not just the building and the construction system um, in relation to the whole manufacturing process, including the work holding device on the right, uh, but also you know, the design of the blocks uh, themselves in relation to the digital machining and tooling processes. After quite a lot of R&D, we yeah. developed a workflow that meant we could prefabricate each block in about 10 to 20 minutes, depending on its type. Using this method, we produced our first test section of wall, meeting a significant part of our brief to make a self-build construction system using solid lightweight blocks of a single plant-based material without mortar or glue, which meant we could proceed to making the 200 or so blocks for the cabin at the Bartlett and transporting them to site in Eton. This makes the whole R&D process look rather easy and straightforward, but take it from me, the reality of course was rather different. The cabin was an extremely important part of the overall project where we worked out a lot of principles that were also deployed for cork house, like this raised floor construction with a perimeter beam supporting cork insulated panels of CLT. Uh, and we experienced some of the issues that we'd have to resolve, like the mobility of the structure at certain points during the assembly process. But from a self-build perspective, it was a pretty successful prototype that even our engineer here from Arup could install. And in terms of structural design, we also got to test out the principle of using the roof light as a paperweight to hold the top few courses of the roof in place. And because the cabin prototype was made at UCL and then taken apart and transported to site for reassembly, it was also proof of concept that the system can genuinely be disassembled at the end of its life for material recovery and reuse. Cabin was also useful for in situ testing, including temperature and humidity monitoring and air tightness. Uh, air tightness was an area where we introduced an extra element to the purity of the solid cork envelope in order to achieve compliance with building regs uh, using a 10 millimeter wide expanding foam tape on the internal face of the joints between blocks. In parallel to these in situ tests, there was a range of laboratory tests to establish various performance aspects of both the material and the system. So University of Bath tested compression and shear. Uh, and creep and out of plane loads too. On the basis of the results, Arab were able to show that the structural scheme for cork house met building regulations. Fire rating of the roof was tested at the BRE in Watford for both spread of flame and structural integrity, which indicated that cork behaves in a similar way to CLT in that it self chars. However, there's obviously a, quite a complex relationship between the fire performance of any plant-based material and the specific design of a building. So as with the structural scheme, Arup engineered a fire scheme for Cork House to meet building regs. 
Wind driven rain was also tested at BRE, which established that the wall performed very well. But the lab test for the bare court roof showed a, a level of water ingress. So we developed a system of removable cedar weatherboarding screwed to the court corbels. And then we retrofitted this system to the cabin for a period of in situ testing. And so by this point, we'd established the basic principle of the solid cork building envelope to meet current building performance standards, which meant we could proceed to the third prototype, the house. As you'll remember, the site was two gardens with a slightly awkward junction between them. So the building was positioned to resolve this relationship with a covered outdoor bay at one end. Uh, in more detail, here's the covered outdoor bay on the left. And you can also see the basic structural diagram too, which is a thick perimeter wall of cork which takes all of the vertical loading compression. And then there's two structural seal T wardrobes in the middle of the plan that are tied to a ring beam at eaves level, which gives the overall structure lateral stability. In the short section, you can see the very clear relationship to the simple structural precedence we showed earlier, where it's literally one thing stacked on top of another. The long section shows that as a series of living spaces, each pyramid is ascribed its own domestic function from the sleeping pyramid at one end on the right to the outdoor bay next to the riverbank at the other end on the left. And this is the house as a prefabricated kit of parts. And because it's literally one thing on top of another, there's also pretty much the order in which this was assembled from cement free removable steel screw pile foundations to the solid timber platform, cork wall blocks in compression, uh, a timber ring beam at eaves level, uh, more solid cork blocks in compression in the roof, and then timber frames and roof lights on top of each pyramid acting like paperweights as with the as with the court cabin. Before we could start on site, there was still some R&D to do in terms of the fabrication system. Uh, there were over six times as many blocks as in the cabin. So we migrated to a commercial five axis CNC fabricator that are called Wup Doodle in Suffolk. Um, it's a really great outfit run by a lovely, if slightly unusual guy. Uh, the principles of fabrication were very similar to the cabin, but much more efficient. And we've since got the machine time down to under five minutes a block, which makes the concept of a prefabricated kit of cork parts look pretty plausible. Cork House was in effect top and tailed by subcontractors for specialist or heavy elements, such as the screw pile foundations and the CLT deck at the bottom of the structure and the roof lights at the top of the structure. Eventually, we were ready to install the prefabricated Akoya ring beam and steel brackets. And as you can see, this is a pretty simple system that required only an impact driver. And then the prefabricated CLT floor platform, which is insulated underneath with yet more cork, of course, uh, and installed with a small telehandler, or sometimes just more old fashioned techniques illustrated here by the Polish man mountain that is Martin, which every site should have. This assembly of the floor deck is emblematic of the construction as a whole. In it, it's a very straightforward relationship between three plant-based materials, namely cork, spruce and a coir. Then the two, seal, the two CLT wardrobes that tie the whole structure down to the deck in terms of lateral loads. Uh, and these are also part of an integrated services strategy using pre-routed channels in the CLT floor and wardrobes which terminate with exposed copper pipes in the pyramids for the sprinkler system and power for the smoke detectors and roof lights. But probably the more important point here is that this allows a clear distinction between the work of the self builder and me and the specialist subcontractors installing the services systems. Back to the cork, the fabrication process was very much a just in time uh, manufacturing process, i.e. the cork blocks were delivered to site more or less in line with when we needed them. And as we'd hoped, the blocks were pretty easy to assemble by a self builder, fairly clean and dry, no wet trades with each full size block weighing in at about 13 kilograms. And to prove the point, uh, here's a journalist having a go. Um, no offence to Chris. Now I've been told even an idiot such as me can have a go at uh, doing a bit of construction. So let's see if this really is idiot proof. And oh, it really is like uh, building blocks. This is, I think, the roof. In. Oh. And there. I think I've just built a wall. Not 
brilliant. But that was about a minute, wasn't it? Amazing. As we found out on the cabin, the dry jointed nature of the cork blocks required some low tech invention occasionally to hold them in place before the whole structure was locked down. By the system of beams at eaves level tied down to the CLT wardrobes, then the bespoke integrated copper gutter went in, uh, which in hindsight was a mistake in terms of the construction sequence. So I won't be uh, doing that again. Then the cobbled roof blocks, which is quite a satisfying process of sorting and laying out the blocks course by course and then tapping them into place using just a rubber mallet. Uh, obviously, this is on a very good day here. Uh, and needless to say, there were several days when it didn't look quite as precise as this. But in general, it's quite a satisfying combination of ancient construction principles uh, made possible by 21st century fabrication techniques. One of the nice things of self-building is the opportunity to work with skilled makers like Sergio, our copper maestro, who was equally happy making elements on site with paper and card or off-site with CNC folding techniques. And then the Akoya roof frames every three or four courses, which meant that we could build without any supporting false work from underneath. And then topping out with the Akoya roof light frames and the steel roof lights for which we relied on Martin's raw Polish muscle once again. And then finally, over 200 boards of Western Red Cedar weatherboarding and about 3000 stainless steel screws. After which comes the always magic moment of striking the scaffolding and then back over to Dido. Yes, um, just a few images really of the completed house. Um, this is the approach um, from Tangier Mill House through the garden. Um, moving through into this bay, as well as this being a threshold between the two gardens, um, it's also an outdoor living space, an antechamber for the house with the front door on the right here. And it's here really that you become aware um, a very direct tectonic of the complete integration of material, structure, construction and space. Um, you pass through this bay to emerge into the garden beyond. You'll see a cork coloured cat here. Um, and this clip gives you a very good idea of how the building relates to its context. Um, so you have the long elevation that addresses the, the rear garden and also screens the Thames water building behind. And right in the far distance, you can see Tangier Mill House. Up closer, the expanded cork is a lovely material in terms of all-round sensory feedback. You just want to touch it. It just feels fantastic. Our friendly journalist, journalists really like that. Um, moving into the main living space, the cork also creates a very calm acoustic um, and it's very atmospheric in terms of the balance of light and shadow. Um, also, um, the cooked cork creates a lovely smoky aroma. Um, the quality of space in the cobbled roof pyramids is the direct result of being enclosed by raw structure and pure compression. And into the bedroom, um, at the end of the plan, probably my favorite space um, because of the sort of monastic quality, it's, there's quite an intense character with control views and daylighting. And the view um, when you're lying in bed looking up, um, this is really where you get the feeling of uh, the sort of physical sensation of load being carried down and around you. We also followed this through um, on the use of solid plant-based materials to all the interior bespoke joinery, such as these Stormfeld oak stools. And in the bathroom, we had a slightly more playful space of reflection and illusion by way of contrast to the solidity of the rest of the house with bespoke brass um, fittings, uh, bath and basin. And as a self-builder, it's always um, great to be able to exploit the luxury of being able to respond to the building and let details evolve, like this copper tray um, and carved rill that feeds into, uh, feeds the rainwater into a frog pond, um, or the semi-formal planting that helps really bed the uh, house and, and let the house sit in the landscape. And then looking beyond its useful life, which we hope will be a very long one, um, the whole house has been designed for disassembly. So that instead of destructive demolition, as discussed earlier, um, the building life cycle has a more symbiotic relationship with natural resource systems, so that the material comes from a biodiverse landscape, it uses waste and byproduct from cork forestry. It's cooked with no additional ingredients or binders using energy from waste biomass. And then it's assembled on site without mortar or glue. 
And as a building, it has a very specific form, which is driven by its life cycle. And then at the end of life, the blocks can simply be disassembled for reuse. They can be recycled into the manufacturing chain or indeed just returned to the soil to biodegrade and generate new growth because it's a pure plant-based material. So that's really it from us, um, Form Follows Life Cycle. Thanks. Thank you very much.